Hi everybody, this is part two of our critical thinking video for, um, for the course. Uh, last time we talked about some attributes of, of critical thinkers and I just want to continue with some of the other attributes that I believe uh, demonstrate forms of critical thinking. So the next thing um, that critical thinkers are able to do is identify parts of arguments. And here we're not talking about arguments in terms of like a shouting match between two people. We're talking about arguments in a logical sense or a philosophical sense. Um, an argument is just uh, composed of premises and conclusions. And the premises are reasons that you have for uh, a definite conclusion. Uh, and so critical thinkers are able to identify parts of arguments and they're also able to identify when somebody doesn't present an argument. For example, um, questions, exclamations, and commands are not forms of sentences that should be rationally taken into account uh, as a part of an argument. So whenever somebody asks you a rhetorical question, uh, that question in itself cannot be uh, supporting evidence for that person's argument because questions are neither true nor false. The same goes with commands and exclamations. Um, so critical thinkers are able to break down arguments into their component parts. Critical thinkers are also able to identify different types of evidence. Um, and how that evidence is used to support an argument or how it's used to try and get somebody to believe something to be the case about reality. So for example, one of the weakest forms of evidence is anecdotal evidence, but you'll often hear people use anecdotal evidence in order to support their claims. So they might say something, um, and then as a justification for their conclusion, they might say, well, my uncle, you know, he was... Uh, in the 1970s, he did this, and so that example demonstrates that my conclusion is true. But talking about a single instance, or even five or six or seven or eight or nine ten, uh, instances, uh, could all be construed as being anecdotal. Now, of course, anecdotal evidence, uh, if you gather enough of it, it becomes um, better evidence, right? Uh, evidence that you might be able to make uh, a generalization from. But in general, and for the most part, uh, scientific evidence, um, that comes from peer-reviewed journal articles or, and or books. Anything that comes from peer-reviewed sources, uh, in, including books and articles, will be probably the best forms of evidence. Now, of course, there's always going to be an outlier. There's always going to be somebody who lied about the evidence, right? Uh, maybe their research methodology wasn't accurate or valid. And it's important to be able to evaluate those things. Um, but in general and for the most part, those forms of evidence are going to be the highest forms of evidence. Claiming that X is the case because your mom told you it was the case, or your dad, or your, you had this experience, um, is actually the weakest form of evidence. Um, another really bad form of evidence is eyewitness evidence. And um, if you go to YouTube, you just type in eyewitness evidence. Uh, problems with eyewitness evidence. And you'll see numerous videos or documentaries uh, they demonstrate that eyewitness evidence is really horrible. <clears throat> For example, I saw one um, study where they pretended to, to mug people, and the people knew that at some point during the day somebody would mug them, right? But they didn't know why it was happening. And um, this, this guy would um, run up to the people, and he would say, give me your wallet, and then you know they would hand over whatever, and then he would run away. But the whole point of the study was uh, they wanted to analyze what people said the guy looked like. Um, and it's, it was all across the board, you know, like 20 different people had 20 different identifications of the person, even so far as to say that it was, some people said that the, the person was white, which he was, and others said that he was black, right? <laughs> um, so eyewitness evidence, and um, there have been numerous cases, I think in the, in the realm of the hundreds, where convictions have been overturned, where there's been an eyewitness who said, yeah, that, that's the guy, I, I saw him or her. Um, and then uh, 
there have been uh, even few, well, fewer cases where there were two witnesses and then fewer where there were three. But even the, in the case where there were three eyewitnesses, uh, it was later found out that the person actually didn't uh, commit the, the, uh, the crime. Um, and then they were let free. Okay, so anyway, critical thinkers are able to identify different types of evidence and relate relevant evidence to different fields. Uh, critical thinkers are, uh, they have knowledge of both formal and informal fallacies. So when somebody presents an argument to you, there's a way uh, that they can do so in a valid manner, uh, if it's a deductive argument. And if it is a deductive argument, sometimes people will run into what are called formal logical fallacies, where the structure of their argument is such that even with true premises, the conclusion still could be false. So one of those examples is uh, if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. So if it rains, then we're not going to have a picnic. Uh, we didn't have a picnic, therefore it rained. That's actually a formal logical fallacy called affirming the consequent. Now people do this all the time. Um, but if you use a structure like this, then what that means is that it could be the case that even if the premises of your argument are true, the conclusion is false. That means that if you tell me a conclusion and then you use this reasoning, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that your conclusion is true, so you need to re rework your reasoning. So, but in addition to formal logical fallacies, there are informal logical fallacies, like the ad hominem fallacy. This is one of the uh, fallacies that, uh, uh, to the person. So uh, in the ad hominem fallacy, somebody presents an argument, and then the person attacks the person rather than the argument, right? So uh, let's say that I am... Um, uh, uh, I'm a woman, right? And I am arguing that um, that women should be paid equally for this, doing the same jobs that men do in in a work environment. You know, and I present ideas about justice and fairness and equality. And then somebody says to me, "Well, the only reason why you're arguing this anyway is just because you're a woman. It supports your own interest." Well, that person hasn't said anything about my argument about justice and fairness and all these things, what they've done is they've attacked the person. The same thing goes, there's a form called the tu quoque, where, um, let's say I'm a smoker, right, and I'm smoking, and I tell my friend, like, hey man, you should really quit smoking, uh, it's really bad for you, it harms your uh, ability to uptake oxygen, it can lead to cancer, and, um, and, you know, your breath stinks, your nails turn yellow, blah, 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 hair falls out, people don't like you, whatever and I'm sitting there smoking, what is my friend going to say to me? Well, you should stop smoking, right? But notice that uh, the, two, the two quoque means you do it too, right? Um, and, uh, but notice that, that my friend didn't respond to any of the premises that I presented, right? And if the, my premises are sound or invalid um, or strong, depending on what type of argument it is, then uh, even though I smoke, I'm still, my argument is still uh, sound or still strong. It's still a good argument. Yeah, and he's right. I should quit smoking too for the very same reasons that I gave. But in attacking me, he's deflected from the actual course of action. Uh, there's another, uh, um, there's another uh, informal logical fallacy called a false dilemma. This is another one uh, to be especially aware of. A false dilemma occurs where you present two options as if they are the only options. Uh, and parents are great at doing this, right? Uh, either you go to bed or you don't get cookies or something. Well, those aren't the two options uh, that exist for the child. Um, and so oftentimes people will present an issue as if there's only two options, right? Either you're for abortion or you're against abortion. Either you think Obamacare is good or it's bad. Either you think people should be taxed this amount or this amount. You're either a Democrat or a Republican. But whenever there are more opportunities um, to be something else, then that would actually be a false dilemma. Um, a loaded question is a rhetorical technique, but it's fallacious or it can lead to fallacious reasoning. Uh, loaded questions are questions that presuppose conditions. Um, for example, the police might arrest a woman and say, why did you murder your husband? Well, that question presupposes precisely what the 
police would have to prove that the woman murdered her husband. So always be careful. Uh, police officers are really good at asking loaded questions, right? Like um, they pull you over and they say, how much have you drank tonight? Without even asking you if you've been drinking. Um, or they say to you, uh, why did you beat your wife? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? They're, they're trained to ask these forms of questions because then people, I guess, are more likely to say like, you know, I did it with the meat cleaver. You know, like they, they can't handle it. Kind of the telltale heart Edgar Allan Poe response, right? Where they just drives them crazy. So then they have to tell, tell the answer. Um, and just as a side note, it's, um, uh, if you're ever accused of a crime uh, and arrested, never say anything except I want a lawyer. Don't say anything. And this, this is just critical thinking 101, but this is a practical application. Uh, a lot of times people say things, right? You have the right to remain silent. Um, but people are like, they say things and then they, they get themselves in a lot of trouble. If you get arrested for something, don't say anything except I want a lawyer. Okay, anyway. Next. Um, let's see, I'll skip that one. Well, maybe not. So critical thinkers, know about different types of arguments. Or they can, maybe know is not the best uh, taxonomy word here, they can identify different uh, types of arguments. And they can also evaluate. So they can identify and evaluate different types of arguments. So there are two general broad categories of arguments, deductive and inductive, and we talked a little bit about that. Deductive arguments are arguments that attempt to prove their conclusions, or which another way to say it is that they attempt to have a, have a structure in which the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. What that means is if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. That would be a valid form of of deduction. An invalid form of deduction is a deductive form that uh, true premises do not guarantee a true, con true conclusion. Inductive arguments fall into general categories, but for example, one is inductive generalization. So um, uh, that, that occurs where you take a certain specific set of data or uh, different examples, and then you, you um, draw uh, inferences based on that sample, and you generalize to like a larger population. Uh, that's a very dangerous activity that people do all the time. Um, but the justification for making those generalizations is a highly debated issue. Um, but anyway, if you don't know the difference between inductive and deductive arguments, then it's going to be hard for you to evaluate those arguments. Uh, the evaluation of the arguments is where you actually analyze the arguments and you attempt to find the strengths and weaknesses of those arguments. So as I mentioned, in a deductive argument, if you don't know how to figure out whether or not it's valid or invalid, you're not going to have a, a formal way of responding to somebody who presents that argument to you. And you might ju then just have to rely on gut instinct um, uh, or intuition. Whereas if you, ha if you understand that the argument is invalid, you can just say to the person, this argument is invalid. You need to either reframe it or um, we can just pretty much stop talking because you're wrong. In terms of, um, <clears throat> of uh, induction, we, we evaluate arguments based on strength or weakness, and, and induction brings in a lot of uh, different elements in terms of um, the types of evidence that are, that are presented. And so if you don't know how to evaluate types of evidence, uh, then it's going to be hard for you to understand whether or not somebody's inductive argument is strong or weak, whether they're making a hasty generalization, uh, whether they have uh, the right logically to extrapolate to a larger group from the sample that they've taken. Um, whether they're allowed to make an analogy. Um, I've, I've often heard uh, students say, God is like the wind. Um, you can't see it, but you, you know it's there. Uh, but that's not an appropriate analogy. And I'm not saying, uh, please don't draw any conclusions about whether or not I believe in the existence of God. But um, God is not like the wind. The wind is a material substance um, that we actually can feel and that we actually feel when we walk outside all the time. And the wind is such a strong material substance, or it can be through different forces, it can be made such a strong material substance. Uh, for example, yesterday there were tornadoes in Illinois. 
uh, the wind can be an extremely powerful thing that we can actually see in the sky and it, that can kill us. Hurricanes, uh, even just walking out and you see the breeze moving the leaves. So it's not, a, it's not a proper analogy to say that God is like the wind um, because we can, in fact, actually know that the wind is there and the next time you don't think the wind is there, just walk outside in a hurricane um, or have somebody blow in your face with the nasty breath or something. Uh, you'll know that, that the wind, in fact, does exist and it's a material substance. Um, well, the wind is not a material substance, but the particles that are in the wind are material substances. So when people make those types of arguments or analogies, uh, it's important to be able to evaluate those analogies to see if, in fact, uh, one can make that um, logical step in reasoning. Okay, moving on. Um, critical thinkers know how to evaluate different types of language. So they know how to evaluate manipulative forms of, of rhetoric, let's say. But let's just call it language and not use fancy words. So there are different ways that people can manipulate language and I don't have a ton of time here so I'll just give one. A euphemism is a word that has a positive or a neutral connotation, but it's used to express something negative. So I had a student who had the best one ever, right? If we say that somebody is fat, that is generally uh, considered a negative way to express uh, the way that they look, um, at least in the English language. Uh, my wife is, is from Peru, and if you're overweight in Peru, uh, people will literally call you gordo or gordita or whatever. So you can imagine like this little girl, right? She's like a little chunky. Um, and they're like, oh, gordita, que linda, and all this stuff, right? Um, and it's just kind of, in Peru, it's really funny. If you have a big nose, everybody calls you like big nose. If you, uh, there's one guy that uh, my wife is friends with, and when he gets really tan, his skin kind of looks purple. So they call him guindon, which means plum. So anyway, they're a lot more literal and uh, they seem to take less offense at these things than we do. But in our society, uh, if you say somebody's fat, uh, that, that's a, a negative word. Um, but I've actually used a couple here that are euphemistic, right? I said overweight. So overweight is a euphemism for fat. Uh, it's, it's a positive or neutral way of saying something that's considered negative. But my student had the best one ever. She said sometimes she calls people fluffy. So, um, and she was a little bit overweight, right? And she said, I'm not fat, I'm fluffy, right? So fluffy is kind of a euphemism for being overweight. Uh, but anyway, people use forms of language uh, to manipulate others. So you might often hear a euphemism, like, right? Like, um, we are the UN Security Council, right? Or we are, uh, let's not use a real example. Let's say I'm part of the League of Citizens Committed to Justice. Um, but really what we do is we go out and we, um, we pretend to be police and we take um, uh, the law into our own hands and we beat people in the streets, right? Just people that we don't like or people that we think are up to shady, shady uh, actions. Uh, but we call ourselves the League of Responsibly Citizen, or Responsible Citizens, Citizens Committed to Justice. Um, and so you'll see this a lot in, uh, in um, one today, uh, the Environmental Studies. I had a meeting with our Environmental Studies Chair. He said, instead of calling things carbon taxes, they call them carbon fees, right? Because a, a tax is something bad, but a fee is something that you just kind of have to pay. Um, oh, there are fees attached. I understand. Thank you. Uh, cell phone company for adding on 14 fees to every one of my bills that I have no clue of understanding. You know, like what is the California carbon fee that aligns with my seven-year-old flip phone? You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, critical thinkers are able to analyze the different types of language and how people use language uh, in ways to manipulate other people. Because look, they even call what the Nazis did, they call them prison camps, right? Prison, they were not prison camps. They were the worst place on earth where mass decimation of humanity occurred, torture, medical experiments on children and, and women and, well, and men too, but 
I mean, these were, these were horrendous places, but we still call them prison camps. They weren't prison camps. They were death camps. They were destruction camps. They were torture, death, destruction, violation camps. That's the word that we should actually use. But it makes everybody feel better when we say prison camps, right? Um, okay, so anyway, the way that we use language uh, can be very tricky, and people often do that, and they often do it to manipulate us. And so critical thinkers are able to evaluate those different forms of language. Okay, let's see. I'm going to do one more because I am... Let's talk about emotion. Emotions get a bad rap in Western philosophy. They also get a bad rap just in general, in society. Um, but anyway, let's talk about emotions. So you might, also, you might often hear that... Um, that it's important, it's important to think rationally, not emotionally, right? You know, like, uh, that emo emotion is like this bodily thing that can't be trusted. But our minds, they can definitely be trusted. So uh, always focus on your mind, not on your body or what your body desires or anything like that. And emotions come from the body. They don't come from the mind. Um, and so therefore, they can't be trusted. Therefore, they don't have a place in society. And, and anybody who expresses those emotions shouldn't be trusted either. But uh, again, that's a hasty generalization. It's a false dichotomy. There are obviously negative emotions and there are obviously positive emotions. And so what critical thinkers do are critical thinkers uh, harness negative emotions and utilize positive emotion. Now there's definitely a cognitive component to this, but I, I personally don't believe that emotions are non-cognitive. Um, uh, I believe that emotions come from the mind just like, um, uh, and, and we inhabit a body, right? Uh, but anyway, apart from that, uh, it doesn't matter what I believe, right? Because I'm just one person and I just gave you anecdotal evidence. So, but anyway, hopefully some of you agree with me. Emotions are not negative inherently, right? They're negative in relation to the outcomes that occur from them. So um, I come from a long line of people who just didn't know how to harness anger. And they did a lot of really horrible things throughout their lives because they were unable to control those negative emotions. Now they did some other great stuff successful in their, uh, in their business pursuits and endeavors, you know, and other things. Um, but that's because they were able to positively use other emotions. So rather than think of reason and emotion as being like two dichotomous things that, that constantly battle, we need to think about them emerging together. And then we need to figure out in our own lives our strengths and weaknesses. Now, I, I, I tend to not be able to harness my anger sometimes. And I know that that is a weakness that I have. And I know that anger in me is a negative emotion. But if I'm a critical thinker, then what I need to do is I need to uh, figure out ways that I can try to harness that negative emotion or be honest about it. So rather than bottling it up, I need to tell those I care about, look, I'm really upset right now. Help me. Like I've literally said to people like, help me. What? And they're like, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know. Just like, I can't deal with this right now. Right. Um, and of course, I think a lot of it has to do with just getting older. As you get older, uh, things die down a bit. Uh, so for those of you who are a bit younger and maybe going through all these things, just give it a little time, things will change. But there's so much focus on negative emotion that, that positive emotions are left out. Uh, care, joy, hope, um, happiness, um, uh, compassion, uh, uh, courage, um, or you know that that emotional experience that occurs in the act of courage, there uh, these are all positive things that that emotionally drive humans to be more than they can actually be. Uh, when a parent holds his or her child for the first time, and the parent is a loving parent, um, the love and 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 joy of of that event probably drives that person to become more compassionate, to become less self-centered. Um, and, and overall, hopefully, in becoming that sort of human, then their life tends to flourish a bit more and tends to become better. Um, 
at least that would be the ultimate goal. Now that doesn't always uh, take place, but our passions are the things that drive our actions. I, I, I kind of agree with Hume here um, that an idea can't drive your action, but, but your passions can. And so figuring out ways to, to try to uh, canalize, to use positive emotions to make yourself a better human. Um, I know that in my own life, when I care about another human and I experience these positive emotions, it often drives me to work harder, to try to be better. Now, I might not be better, but I try. Um, it drives me to make more out of my life uh, than I would if I didn't have these other caring and loving and hopeful relationships. So anyway, the last thing I'll leave us with, uh, and there are probably 10 more bullet points, but over the last, um, the last couple uh, lectures, you've gotten a list of, of, of things that I believe uh, are attributes of critical thinkers. And uh, that if you can start to do these things, then you'll be moving in a positive direction in relation to critical thinking. And then th I've also tried to make these general enough to, to where there are skills that you can use and apply in any situation. And this is obvious, right? If somebody at work ticks you off, you know, do what you gotta do. Go to the bathroom, scream at yourself in the mirror. Um, you know, whatever it takes, just, you know, just to har try to harness those negative those negative things and then when you experience success and joy and hope and all these other things use those experiences to drive you on it's not enough just to say in your head like oh I can do it I can do it I can do it no like sometimes we actually have the experience of being driven by a vital force in us and so figuring out ways to cultivate those vital forces um, and fight against the ones that seek to undo us or to undo our character or to undo everything that we that we love and that we hope for that's what a critical thinker does in relation to emotion the critical thinker doesn't think in terms of a, a sharp line between reason uh, and emotion so anyway i hope that you found these these uh, tips about skills for critical thinking helpful and uh, remember that uh, the the path of critical thinking takes a lifetime and uh, every day we're going to fail, and every day we have the opportunity to do something right. And um, little tiny victories lead to uh, overall change and development in our own lives. So I hope that you'll start or continue working down the path of small victories um, and realize that this is a lifetime process. Never think that it can be done in a day, nor that it should be done in a day. And accept yourself in your failure uh, and uh, rejoice in your victories. Uh, yeah, have a good day.